all to the inaugural session of three-day IIHSC International Conference 2022 on Human Security and Governance. Two years after, again, I'm organizing a conference on human security. But I want to share a very good personal experience with you all. In security, many of them are asking what is human security. But I think COVID made us all aware about different dimensions of human security along with conventional thought of security or rather national or physical security. When I added the word governance with human security, I was very skeptical whether people will be eager to talk on this issue or not, as there are very few books and in Google also, you can't get much material. For first two months after announcement, we received only eight asterisks, but then we had third wave in India. I don't know whether there are any correlation or not, but suddenly we flooded with paper proposals. And today we have almost 200 papers with diversified perspectives and new thoughts. If you read paper titles and abstracts, I hope you agree. Some topics may sound very controversial and some topics may seem illogical to someone. But this platform is for dialogue and discussion. Therefore, we accommodated all. In fact, there is a main notion, that is the main notion of human security. It gives sp space and priority to every human individual. Human security is a human right and governance ensures human rights through its key attributes like transparency, responsibility, accountability, participation, and responsiveness to the needs of the people. This conference will focus on all three aspects of security, which are freedom from want, freedom from fear, and freedom from indignity to analyze the role and functioning of nation states, as well as non-state actors like international organizations, MNCs, NGOs, etc., in securing human security goals. Furthermore, this conference aims to create a network and support the international community of academicians, researchers, scholars, and scientists by promoting an exchange of latest trends, developments, and challenges in this field. More than 400 academicians, policy practitioners, and social activists have registered for this conference from all parts of the world. There are 10 panels which are different dimensions of human security, human security, health and governance, human security, education and governance, human rights and governance, human rights and sustainable development, women in governance and human security, human security and non-state actors, child security and governance, human security and pandemic, human security and law. And there will be five special sessions, namely human rights and governance, women in security, governance based state politics and human security, food security and governance, and defense strategy and human security. Not without delaying further, I want to introduce our honorable guest of inaugural session now. You can see we have an August gathering here. We have with us honorable professor, Dr. Shirin Akhtar, vice chancellor, University of Chittagong, Dr. Pushpa Iyer, Director, Center for Conflict Studies, Middlebury Institute of International Studies, USA. Professor Dr. Elina C. Kamak, Director, Center for Effective Public Management, Brooking Institute, USA. Professor Dr. Sanjay K. Bharadwaj, Director, Energy Studies Program, JNU, India. Professor Dr. Pam Rajput, Founder and Director of Center for Women's Studies and Development and Head of the Department, Political Science, Punjab University. Professor Dr. Alka Parik, Dhirubhai Ambani Institute of Information and Communication, Gujarat. Professor Dr. Aura Martin, Vice President of the International Institute of Human Security, USA. Professor Benu Kumar Dev, Pro Vice Chancellor, University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. Professor Dr. Rajpal Budaniya, Department of Political Science, Allahabad University. And Dr. Andre Karla, Senior Researcher, Institute for Minority Rights and URAC Research, Italy. Now, uh, I want to invite our guest of honor to speak, Dr. Elina C. Kamar. She is Senior Fellow in the Governance Studies Program, as well as Director of the Center for Effective Public Management at the Brookings Institute. She is an expert on American electoral politics and government innovation and reform in the United States, OECD nations, 
and developing countries. She received her PhD in political science from University of California, Berkeley. She is also a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She was one of the founders of new democratic movement that helped elect Bill Clinton president. She served in the White House from 1993 to 97, where she created and managed the Clinton administration's national performance review, also known as the Reinventing Government Initiative. At the Kennedy School, she served as director of visions of governance for the 21st century and as faculty advisor to the innovations in American government awards program. In 2000, she took a leave of absence to work as senior policy advisor to the Gore campaign. Dr. Kamak makes regular appearances in the media, including segments on ABC, CBS, NBC, the BBC, CNN, Fox News, now New England Cable News and National Public Radio. Her topic of today's presentation is governance after COVID. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate being here. Am I uh, unmuted? Yes, okay. Um, I appreciate being here and good evening from Washington DC where it is almost midnight. So um, I hope you will bear with me if I yawn a bit. Um, let me say that no topic could be more timely than the relationship between human security and governance. As we enter the third year of a global pandemic, we need to assess where we've been and where we are going. So let's establish at the outset of this conference and of my remarks that uh, public health catastrophes and human security are in danger because there will be catastrophes that happen again and again. Climate change is having devastating consequences on human health and well being. From pandemics to natural devastation to mass migrations, we are looking at a future filled with old and new increases in respiratory and heart diseases. We will see water scarcity in some places and flooding in other places that will cause massive injury and homelessness. We'll, uh, food security and lower nutrient food quality will affect many people, as will deaths and injuries from climate-related events. It is well known that climate and weather affect the distribution and heighten the risk of many vector-borne diseases. Add to this the possibility of bioterror attacks, and it becomes clear that in spite of all the progress we have made in combating, combating disease, we are at the beginning of a new era that threatens human health and human security. These threats are global and cannot be dealt with by governing bodies as they are currently constituted for one simple reason. Traditional government is based on the notion of jurisdiction, jurisdiction and boundaries and 21st century issues do not respect geographic boundaries. Acid rain can affect areas far from the source of the pollution. Hackers in one country can disrupt internet operations in another side, on another side of the world. And as we've seen, diseases that originate in one country quickly become global. So the challenge for the 21st century governance is to reinvent itself to respond to global crises. So let me focus my remarks on public sector institutions and their preparedness or lack thereof to handle these challenges. I am not going to set out so much a, a list of uh, solutions as I am a list of things we, we have to take a look at in each country, okay? So, I, I, and you'll see what I mean. But first, let's look at the global response to, a health, to the most recent health catastrophe of COVID. On May 29th, 2020, at the height of the pandemic, President Donald Trump made a startling announcement. He will be withdrawing the United States from the WHO, World Health Organization, at the height of a global pandemic. Uh, at the time, this was seen as just one more irrational action at the hands of an unpredictable and unusual president. It masked, however, serious and long-running weaknesses, not simply with the WHO, but in the global architecture surrounding health. 
So we need to get better at globally predicting pandemics and health catastrophes, figuring out how we can better coordinate global response, analyzing the strengths and the weaknesses of the WHO, and perhaps understand the experience with and the impediments to the distribution of global vaccinations and other needed drugs. Finally, perhaps we can learn something from the well-established area of military to mill or mill to mill relations, um, where militaries regularly inter of one nation regularly interact and get to know the militaries of another nation for the purposes really of preventing accidental war. Uh, and perhaps we can think about that concept in relationship to health to health relations between countries. So that's first, that's globally. Second, I think every nation needs to do what in the military they call an after action review of its governmental and NGO organizations. In other words, look back at the COVID experience and ask, okay, what went right and what went wrong? So in the United States, uh, this look would look something as follows. Um, our leading government health agency, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, received a great deal of criticism during the pandemic, and it's frankly ongoing. It offered conflicting advice about mask wearing, it was slow to develop and approve a COVID-19 test, and it struggled with the White House how and when to release complex scientific data to the public. It was unable to put together timely data on testing cases and deaths, leaving it frankly to John, Johns Hopkins universities to create the most reliable database. And as I said, this confusion from CDC is still going on. On the other hand, the Food and Drug Administration fared much better as we look back at it. They were in charge of something called Operation Warp Speed, which developed the vaccines against COVID in record time. And no one, no one thought it could be done in the amount of time that it took. It is worth studying and understanding the Operation Warp Speed for what it can teach us about the development of medications and treatments and vaccines in times of crisis. But the FDA also had to contend with a torrent of information about drugs that could cure COVID from um, hydrochloroquine to Invermectin, and it had to stand up to White House interference in its work. Um, in all of the COVID response in the first year, President Trump's erratic leadership was a major problem. But that said, it should not mask the underlying problems in the federal government's health agencies. So the second thing I would urge each country to do is do their own version of the look that I will be taking at the US federal government. A, is it capable of dealing with a pandemic? Um, B, what's wrong with the Centers for Disease Control? Was it, and why is it, it received so much criticism for its on again, off again guidance? Um, what about funding levels, staffing levels, and the lack of authority that the federal government had over state and local governments. Um, what about the FDA? Why did Operation Warp Speed work so well? And can it be replicated in for other diseases and in other pandemics and, and in other countries? Um, how should we think about stockpiling health supplies and developing a surge capacity for healthcare workers? And was the Defense Production Act used effectively at every stage of the pandemic? So those are a bunch of tough questions, which I think the US federal government needs to look at. And then I would urge other national governments to look back and ask a, a parallel, they won't ask obviously the same questions, but ask a parallel set of questions to better understand what they should do next time. Um, thirdly, in most countries, especially very large ones like the United States or India, um, an enormous amount of decision making and the delivery of services goes on at the state and local government. Um, 
in the US, we have a federal system. It divides power between the national government and the state governments. And this system turned out to be both a blessing and a curse during the pandemic. Once Donald Trump decided that his starring role in the pandemic was hurting his popularity, he handed over vast amounts of responsibility to the governors. It was up to governors to declare a state of emergency. Um, with little federal guidance, they found themselves bidding against one another for protective equipment when shortages were rampant, and then often cooperating with each other in order to share that equipment as the virus moved from state to state. There were some governors which rose to the challenge. Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, became a national star for a while for his sure-footed handling of the crisis in contrast to President Trump. When the vaccine was developed, it, it fell to the governors who had to figure out the complicated logistics of getting the vaccines into the arms of the citizens. For several months, we had a vaccine, but we had a very confused and very uncertain method of actually delivering the vaccine. State health organizations found themselves overwhelmed by the pandemic, and they implemented a patchwork of responses. Some criticized the decentralized approach to the pandemic, but in other ways, the variety of responses did allow states to learn from each other. So this leads us to the need to consider when it comes to public health, what is the division between the national government and state or provincial and local governments? Um, what were the strengths of the federal system in a pandemic and what were the weaknesses? What was learned about vaccine distribution that can be applied to the distribution of other critical drugs? And how can interactions between the federal and state governments be improved? Um, to, for example, um, there is some talk about creating robust pandemic response units at the state level in each state's National Guard. During COVID, the Guard was called upon to conduct tests, to sanitize facilities, and provide logistical supports uh, to, the, to the healthcare professionals. So there is a, an infrastructure there that probably needs some elaboration. Fourth, what is the role of civil society in the governance system as it addresses health crises and other issues of human security? Now, this question varies from country to country, depending, of course, on the capacity of the state and the capacity of civil society. In the United States, the response to COVID was primarily governmental, but the actual delivery of a lot of the aid was in fact, did in fact go through non-governmental entities. Um, in other countries where the state is weaker and the civil society is supported by international funding, it will be important to evaluate how that relationship worked and how it can be improved. And my final point is that we need to evaluate the public response and how it complicated governing. The business of governance is, of course, as everyone knows, profoundly affected by public opinion, which tends to define the scope and or the limits of governmental action. On the one hand, the pandemic brought out the best in people as they banded together to help their neighbors who are isolated and are unemployed or very sick. On the other hand, pandemic responses from mask wearing to vaccine refusals took on the hyper-partisan tinge that has characterized American politics for several decades now, with Republicans refusing to get vaccinated in numbers higher than Democrats. And this, this frankly was all, this was really unexpected, okay? The, the, the partisanship of surrounding vaccines and mask wearing came as a surprise to most people. And that's something that we still need to really understand. And so for instance, we need to know how public health information is received and interpreted by the public and how does it relate to the broader culture of each country. 
In the United States, we have such a deeply individualistic culture and a deep attachment to human freedom that vaccine mandates and mask mandates were bitterly opposed by um, a portion of the public, and they and still are, and probably prolonged the severity of the pandemic. Um, what's we need to identify which segments of the public hold deep suspicions about governmental mandates and how did the approval of public leaders from governors to the president vary over the life of the pandemic um and in what ways it how what affected this the swings in public opinion most and lastly how did public opinion constrain governmental action. Um, and by that, that is probably the, the place where, at least in the American context, um, it is most important to establish a, a trust and community with a trust and knowledge with community leaders and the media. Um, the community leaders and, and NGOs, um, churches, for instance, were found to be quite critical to the dissemination of information and the breaking down of suspicion about vaccines and about the um, the pandemic itself. And I think that a government needs to focus more on television producers and anchors, administrators of social media sites, and community leaders as much as possible so that the there are mechanisms for injecting basic knowledge about crises to trusted community leaders. So in closing, let me say these, these are five areas that I think each government can set out to, to look at and figure out what has happened in this last these last two years where we have gone through a, a great challenge to human security. Um, and one that is frankly still going on. And I think if each country, if we if we make the global assessments, and then if each country looks within itself and asks the hard questions, and I've just outlined some of the questions that I will be asking about the American government, um, I think we will move forward in progress and perhaps have a governance system that is better able to protect and enhance human security. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity, and I wish you the best of luck for the conference. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for this uh, wonderful speech. I think uh, this becomes a really inaugural uh, speech like uh, you have mentioned and covered all the aspects what I tried to mention in the concept note, and uh, that is the purpose of this conference to have uh, discussion uh, on the very important aspects of human security and as well as connecting it to the governance because uh, individually we can't do anything but if we are having support of uh, civil society as well as national government we can do better I think so thank you ma'am uh, now without uh, delay I want to uh, invite our uh, presidential addressee Uh, Honorable Professor Dr. Shirin Akhtar, uh, who is a current and first female Vice Chancellor of University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. In 2020, she received a uh, received Begum Roke Award, which is Bangladeshi national honor conferred on individual women for their exceptional achievement. The award is given by Ministry of Women and Children Affairs of the Government of Bangladesh to honor the pioneering contribution of an individual in empowering women and raising women's issues. As a renowned academician and researcher, she received many other awards, some notable of which are uh, Shahitya Puraskar, UNESCO Award, and many more. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. A very good morning to you all. Greetings from the University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. I am very pleased and honored to be part of the Indian Institute of Human Security and Governance International Conference 2022 on Human Security and Governance 
which is going to be held on February 23rd, 25th, 2022. I am delighted to declare this conference is being organized by Inter Interdisciplinary Institute of Human Security and Governance, Delhi, India in collaboration with Center for Conflict Studies, Middle Valley Institute and International Studies, Monterey, CA USA, Security Women, United Kingdom, Department of Politics and International Relationship, Central University of Charkhan, India, Department of Defense and Strategic Studies, Himachal Pradesh University, Shimla, India, and Department of International Relationship, U University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. Traditional stage-based security concept has become age old and working less at the present time. Globalization where the world has been considered as global village and people are global citizens. People are prime concern of globalized world. Counted as a people centered of non-traditional approach of security. Human security is a human right. It refers to the spirit of people and communities as op op opposed to the security of state. Human security that talks about three freedoms, freedom for fear, freedom for want, and freedom for in indignity has promoted individual as an important factor and in international relations, which is a sticking characteristics of conflicts. To ensure worldwide human security, what is needed to most in collective action of the states all over the world. Governance is a collective action, action of states, government, civil society, ENGOs, NGOs, and different stakeholders. Good governance can ensure human safety of the world. Prevention is the core of, of human security searching out the root causes, addressing, focusing on them and participating. A good governance would be a solution for human insecurity. Promoting multi-sectoral partnership, building and strengthening local capabilities to fight insecurities might faithful for enhancing social causes and increasing respect for human security and human rights as well. Last but not the least, there is no alternative of localization of national and international agenda and leaving no one behind to ensure the fulfillment of human security. I hope that the knowledge gained through this conference will play an influential role in human security. I wish for the success of this internet. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your wonderful speech. Uh, we got uh, new information and dimensions uh, about the theme. Uh, now, it's my privilege to invite our next speaker, Honorable Professor Benukumar De, who is Pro Vice Chancellor of uh, University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Honorable Moderator. Honorable audience, ladies and gentlemen, online, good time. And greetings from Chittagong University. At the outset, on behalf of Sri University, I would like to thank and congratulate 
interdisciplinary institutes of human security and governance of delhi united kingdom and department of international relations university of chittagong for organizing such an important and time demanding virtual conference on human security and governance especially in this post covid situation it is my pleasure to thank honorable chairperson convener and honorable chief guest professor dr srinakthar and other all honorable speakers and participants of this conference it is my pleasure also to express my best wishes to all participants here online i feel honored to be here in the inaugural session as a special guest we know we are in a global village to live here together peacefully and safely with good health we must pay attention to different components of human security their challenges indicator for measurement and good governance there are many uh, components for human security such as economic security food security health security environmental security personal security community security political security especially post covid pandemic security uh, or to meet all these components we must face a lot of challenges such as war poverty under development terrorism social inequality human trafficking health pandemic and sudden economic and financial downturn to overcome this we need very good governance as there are uh, many many components uh, mainly eight components mentioned by united nations to meet all these uh, human security such as rule of law transparency responsiveness consensus oriented equity and inclusiveness effectiveness and efficiency and accountability so all participants require that all groups particularly those most vulnerable have directed or representative access to the system of government this manifests as the strong civil society and citizen with the freedom of associations and expression i hope all these problems will be discussed explained and all participant will be enriched by exchanging their views and knowledge in this conference for three day till three day long conference so uh, i again want to thanks the organizing committee to invite me and give me opportunity to share my views i wish a successful completion of the long conference uh, here and i hope i expect more collaboration of senior citizen university with this kind of institute in future i hope that acquiring knowledge from this conference will help in this human security and good governance thank you all again uh, thank you sir for your wonderful speech and uh, good wishes uh, we hope we will uh, collaborate more for uh, this kind of uh, research activities uh, now without wasting time i want to uh, meanwhile our uh, special addressee dr andre karla who is phd in politics new school for social research new york usa post graduate studies in diplomacy and international relations university of bologna italy he is a senior researcher at the institute for minority rights of urac research in uh, italy uh, he was previously a visiting fellow at the foundation uh, bruno kressler research center on international politics and conflict resolution uh, and he taught at the university of dayton usa his research explores the interplay among ethnic politics and minority protection migration studies and security issues focusing in particular on the concepts of de-securitization 
and Human Security and their application to minority issues. He is co-editor of Migration in Autonomous Territories, the case of South Tyrol and Catalonia, and authors of articles in academic publications such as Ethnopolitics, Nationalism, and Ethnic Politics, JEMS, and EYMI. He is also a contributor and author of editorials for the local South Trillion newspaper, Atlo Edige. Kerala participated in several third-funded projects, serving as a principal investigator of the URAC research team in the AMIF-funded research project, Volunteer and Empower, Enhancing Community Building and Social Integration Through Dialogue and Collaboration Amongst Young Europeans and Third Country Nationals. Currently, he is network member and part of network board of the Erasmus Project, the Securitization of Migration and Ethnic Minorities and the Rise of Xenophobia in the EU. Today's uh, his presentation will be on minority protection from a human security perspective, building a human security index for minorities. Over to you, sir. Uh, hi, uh, greetings. Welcome from greetings from Italy. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks a lot for but first of all, thanks uh, for San Andini for uh, this invitation and for this really extensive introduction. And thanks for to the organizer of this uh, conference. Uh, uh, so let, let me start uh, just with a few information about uh, EURAC, my institute. So I come from uh, Institute of Minority Rights of EURAC Research, which is a research center located in South Tyrol, in Bolzano, in Italy, which is a, an autonomous province with a German-speaking minority and a Latin population, and which is usually considered um, a model to deal with ethnic tension. But so in my institute, we work a lot with minority rights. Uh, but actually, in my institute, uh, we deal with uh, different institutes with other topics, the great variety from health observation to regional development or biomedicine. So just this brief introduction. Uh, so let me tell you, it's a, well, it's a really honor for me to be here because uh, I come from the field of minority rights and minority protection uh, and also study of migrant integration. Uh, I look how these issues intersect with security, but I don't come from the field of human security, so I'm really looking forward to this conference. And also because I'm going to present uh, uh, something which is on, uh, let's say, on a regional stage. So I'm going to present some preliminary thoughts on a research project I engaged recently. So a brief outline of my presentation. Uh, first, uh, I will, uh, uh, which is, I say, that is entitled Minority Protection from a Human Security Perspective Towards Building a Human Security Index for Minorities. So first of all, I'm going to discuss a bit the connection between minority issues, security issues, and, human, and the concept of human security. Then I will explain, try to discuss why we should have a, a human security perspective when we deal with minorities. And finally, uh, so what is the added value of this human security concept when we apply to minority issues? And finally, we'll uh, provide some preliminary thoughts on uh, is the, what is human security in this for minority, which uh, I'm trying to develop. So uh, starting with the connection between this minority security issue, these have been long in connection with these two, these type of issues, because on the one hand, we know that state uh, geopolitical insecurity might have caused unfair treatments of minority. On the other hand, we know that actually the development of a minority rights regime, international minority rights regime, is a result of security concern, in particular the fear of ethnic conflict, especially after the end of the Cold War. And also we saw like how often arrangements to deal with divided society and ethnic conflict, like power sharing, for example, are often supported by agreements on security issues like issues of demilitarization or the organization of the police security forces. But more important, we saw in the past, uh, I would say since 9-11 a lot, we saw a lot of scholars and also um, literature and also NGOs, they focus on the issues of the process of securitization of minorities. So uh, securitization, the process to which uh, issues is considered as existential threat requiring emergency measures. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of this work looking how why minorities are securitized 
And when we look at this type of work, uh, we kind of notice there is kind of a normative assumption. So there's uh, this negative understanding of the process of securitization, negative understanding of security practices and security predicaments. So we don't want to deal with security issues. Uh, we want to desecuritize minorities. There's a lot of scholars like Jess Hussman, Squire, they kind of have this approach. But uh, then the question that uh, we should raise is whether security has a value to be achieved. But the key question is whether it's to us is the view security. So when I apply, when I study minority issues, I don't want to get rid of the concept of security. But uh, my aim is to enlarge the scope of security. That's why I bring in the concept of human security. I see human security actually as the other side of the coin of securitization. So there's this coin with two faces. On the one hand, securitization. On the other hand, human security. So when we deal with minority issues, we need to analyze them along these two cross-cutting dimensions. The degree of human security provided, as well as the degree we deal with securitization processes and we foster desecuritization of minorities. Uh, so I'm not going to spend much time on the concept of human security in this environment because I assume most of you have um, kind of a lot of maybe probably even more knowledge than myself. So it's a, it's a broad concept. We know that with various interpretation, we can summarize in the slogan freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom from indignity. Is a people-centered, comprehensive, context-specific, and prevention-oriented approach really important? It combines the need to protect together with the need to empower peoples and communities and combine the security with developmental and rights issues. In the original formulation, as we heard before, of human security, there, it was defined with seven categories, economic, food, health, environmental, personal, community, and political. Uh, we know this list is not comprehensive and all the issues are interconnected, but uh, I mentioned also because it within as a category, it's the category of uh, community security which is particularly relevant when we speak about minority issues. So community security as the safety from discrimination, oppressive community practice, ethnic conflict. And also because this is, together with community security, we have an overlapping concept, which has been developed in particular by scholar from security studies, which is the concept of societal security, which focus more on the group level, the group dimension, the need to protect the identity of groups. And also we have another concept, cultural security, which is a bit in between community and uh, societal security. Uh, we can uh, define as the freedom to renegotiate the individual and collective identity. So, and anyway, I see how especially community security and societal security are two concepts that overlap, but they can combine because the security of individual is mediated by the complex of his uh, uh, social relations. So uh, we have uh, several works actually in the past. I'm not the first one to look at minority issues from a, a human security perspective. We, have, we saw in the past various application of a human security to minority issues, in particular regarding vulnerable groups. Uh, so a lot of work has been done on the intersection between uh, international migration, human security, and development. Uh, here uh, we saw the most, uh, also regarding the process of migrant integration, here we saw the other value of human security approach because allowed to focus on protecting vulnerable people rather than uh, blocking them or controlling them. Also, it's, better, uh, uh, it's a better approach to deal with issues like trafficking. Uh, it provides the perspective of victims, uh, stress issues of deprivation, as well as structural barriers and uh, help to go beyond the notion of, uh, for example, migrants, they need to fit into pre-existing social structures. We also saw this uh, comes to human security applied to other type of vulnerable groups like indigenous people. Here uh, we saw in at least scholarship done by other scholar, uh, research done by other scholar. We saw how a human security approach help to highlight the challenge faced by indigenous people, like process modernization, industrialization, demographic pressure, and uh, allow to better include the voice of indigenous people and also to develop better tailored policies to consider the need of indigenous people. Also, we have a lot of work uh, that uh, apply the concept of community security or societal security to minority issues, so a lot of work dealing with the, what are the threats to community security and social security and how what tools do we have to try to prevent or provide uh, insecurity and provide the community or societal security. So uh, what do we gain from a uh, human security yep. perspective? Yep. Perspective. Okay. 
apply to minority issues. Uh, we do have actually some limits, for example, the, the concept of societal security tend to essentialize groups and identities. And also we still distinguish between the those who need to be secure and those who are not should not be secure. Uh, but anyway, we saw a, also a great added value because human security provides a more complex picture of the minority landscape than what is usually provided by traditional scholarship dealing with minorities. For example, all the works on minority protection, they tend to focus on providing a set of individual and group minority rights. We look at migrant integration studies. Again, here the focus is to providing rights, providing access to core institution or improve social relations. If you look at all the work on institutional design for divided societies or so constitutionalism, for example, uh, we see the focus on peace, stability, uh, functional government and justice. Uh, so instead we see how human security provide, uh, in addition, human security can complement this approach and provide uh, is, uh, uh, more compre comprehensive understanding of minority issues because it allows to address minority issues in the total context of uh, living for members of minorities. It broadens the arena of action in which we need to intervene when we deal with minorities and, for example, help identify insecurities that are not covered by rights, in the foster the ownership of rights, and the give the potential to enjoy these rights. And more important, as I mentioned before, a key element of women security is not just about protection, but it's the focus on empowering minorities, which is something that is missing in the minority rights regime. The minority rights focus a lot on protection, not much on empowerment. And also, uh, human security promotes the idea of a common shared security. Uh, so the idea that uh, the security of the majority is unlikely on the basis of the insecurities of the minorities. So it breaks the distinction between majority and minorities. So uh, I try to, we know human security is because it's a broad concept, it's hard to operationalize, but I try to develop this human, this idea of having a human security index for minorities to analyze their insecurities or their security. And the pro of this, uh, in this will be that we are speaking about governance. Uh, it will allow allowed us to assess the situation of vulnerabilities. It might help to reveal areas of neglect, gaps in service, especially gaps between measure of protection and the reality on the ground. It might help to strategize actions and define priorities. Might help to foster further debate, awareness, and research. But we have some problem when we speak about an index because in the build, uh, building an index is always problematic. So we have problems of data availability, certainty, integrity, aggregation. We have the contradiction between subjective and objective measurement. We have the risk of having a lot of bias, whether un, uh, uh, intentional or unintentional. But we, we can build on a lot of experience regarding human security index. We have a general index that provides that deal with some aspect of human security. At the same time, we have some specific index on human security. I'm not going to, so, but we can get a lot of uh, lessons from this type of index. So, the first lesson is we need a clear definition of what we are measuring with this index. So, what is human security for minorities? Uh, it's a, a provisional definition I, I elaborate. It's a, a human security for minority address the minority status of individuals, guaranteeing their material and immaterial well being development and rights in light of their ethnocultural cultural features and protecting them by and empower them to our chronic threat and study disruption in the path of daily life. So it's a broad definition that includes the three slogans of human security. With minorities, I refer both to old minorities, like national minorities, indigenous people, as well as new minorities stemming from recent migratory flow. Uh, we should, this uh, ring should be developed with a top-down and bottom-up process. It should include quantitative and qualitative data. We need to rely to collect the data information on local knowledge, the expert or local uh, the expertise of local researcher. We need to agree some degree of subjectivity. My not all the data might be available, so we can use indirect proxies. And how to organize the data here, I'm thinking that we should, we should use space as a common denominator, but not like the national level, as been done in many index, uh, but we look at the subnational level, for example, South Euro here in South Euro, or other many subnational space. Uh, as because, uh, 
This is because uh, our index by minorities might not work because we know that within a country, a minority might be, uh, might be, uh, uh, might be experiencing different level of human security or being dealt with differently. For example, here in South Rio, the Latin speaking population is really highly protected, but in other parts of Italy, it's not so protected. Uh, some, of, some future thoughts. Uh, we need that was the content of the data and the data on uh, they should try to mirror both the two dimension of human security the data on protection on protection given and empowerment uh, they should measure both the level of human security of minority members as well gaps in comparison with the majority they will should include the out, output variables as well as the input variables so information on where minority members stand in regard to human security also information on specific laws and policies provided regarding how to organize uh, the segregated concept of human security organize the index i go back to the seven original categories uh, but these are, you know, they are not comprehensive, but these are areas in which security issues might unfold, especially interact, because we want, we are interested in particular in the interaction between, with the uh, community security category. So how uh, economic security interact with community security. So uh, we need to redefine the original seven categories to capture this intersection with community security issues. Uh, here we see some, uh, attempt to redefine these, uh, these categories. So for example, community security, I actually prefer the concept, uh, the definition of cultural security, which refers to freedom of cultural identities and cultural dignity, uh, intercommunity peace, protecting and power in regards to identity-based discrimination, oppressive practice and tensions. If you see uh, economic security, what we're measuring with this, this index actually is means the freedom from poverty and assure equal, because this was the interest, the equal access, between majority and minorities to basic income and resource for members of minorities through employment of social safety or social safety nets in like of culturally driven economic practice in order to provide growth and capacity to deal with economic downturns. We look, for example, food security again, regards freedom from hunger and famine and equal, again, a highlight is equal physical and economic access to basic food for members of minority through access employment or income in light of the cultural lifestyle and economic system. Another example, political security. It's the freedom for political state repression and abuse and equal access to political decision-making process and political engagement for minorities and their members and their political perspective. Again, it's trying to redefinish, try to redefine the category of human security to keep in mind the specific needs of the minority population. And then here's some I sketch a bit uh, some examples of the indicator that could be used to build this index. Uh, for example, again, in cultural security, this is something we already saw in a uh, basic, they come also from general human security index. So number of identity-based conflict, but we're interested in minority population growth rate, the use of minority language growth rate among the output indicators. So if we look at input indicators, the presence of minority culture in public space or arrangement to promote social cohesion and diversity. If you look at economic security, we are interested like in, in a human, like in general human security index to income, but we are interested in the incomes of both majority and minority to see the differences or employment rate of majority and minorities or percentage of enterprise activities owned by minorities. Or if you look at input indicators, the inclusion of minority cultural practice in economic policies or arrangement for minority business. Uh, last, just I think my time is gone if I'm not correct, if I'm correct. Sir, you can, you can continue, sir, no issue. Okay, it's fine, but uh, I, was going, it's, it's, I was going to finish. Uh, if you look at health security again, it is an index for dealing with uh, minority issues. So we are, we are considering in general health security concern, life, expect, life expectancy. But again, we want to see the gap between majority and minorities. Or also we want to see the number of uh, uh, doctors that uh, come from the minority population or people that are employed in the health sector compared to the percentage of the majority. Or we want to see whether there are health service minority language or we saw with the COVID pandemic a really big problem for minorities. We want to see health literacy minority language and stuff like this. So these are just uh, 
I'm not going to look at the entire uh, list of examples of indicators. These are just some examples uh, where uh, my work is going. And I think the type of uh, indicator that could be used to develop this index. I have just to conclude. Uh, so far, I've uh, worked a lot uh, uh, using, uh, uh, looking what has been done in, within the field of human security, and I brought that expertise within the field of minority protection and migrant integration. But also we have many, this type of index has been developed a lot within the field of minority protection and, uh, and uh, migrant integration to measure different things like the degree of social cohesion or the level of multiculturalism of a city. So I think there is a, still a lot uh, of knowledge out there that can be brought in to develop these human security index for minorities. And uh, I conclude here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrea, uh, for your wonderful speech. Uh, actually, uh, if we are talking about human security, we need to talk or uh, focus uh, especially on the minority issue. And uh, we are really obliged to you because uh, you are, I think, in the whole uh, panel only one in the inaugural session who is touching this issue. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, now I want to- uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, now I want to again invite uh, Professor uh, Dr. Arora Martin. Uh, she is Professor at Pontifical Oriental Institute of Vatican, Italy. Uh, she is anti-discrimination and gender expert, uh, senior advisor in international relations within the Romanian government and parliament on behalf of National Agency for Equal Opportunities, Ministry of Family, Youth and Equal Opportunities uh, of National Council for Combating Discrimination, Vice President of the International Institute for Human Security, uh, USA. Uh, she is a mentor in the uh, Telematthews uh, Global Thinkers Program, UK. In 2015, she was nominated the Women of the Year in Romania for defending and promoting women's rights. She received international awards for the protection and promotion of women's rights from the Women's uh, Economic Forum and other prestigious awards like the Women of the Decade in Security and Conflict Transformation, Award of Excellence and Recognition from the Egyptian government and iconic women creating the better world for all. She published eight books uh, on gender security uh, and uh, international politics and she was resource person and guest of honor in many prestigious seminars worldwide. Uh, we are really happy to have you amongst us. She is also advisory member of uh, Interdisciplinary Institute of Human Security and Governance, New Delhi. Uh, her today's topic of discussion is modern slavery as an old and new threat to Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to be next to, to the um, forum, to the conference uh, this year as well. I was uh, next to the Institute and next to Dr. Nandini since the beginning. And um, uh, today, uh, uh, I'm very glad that uh, the conference on human security and good governance focuses on uh, three aspects of security, freedom from want, freedom from fear, and freedom from indignity, uh, because all of them referring analogical statement on human security and human trafficking. And this is my issue today, and I want to, to, uh, to uh, focus uh, on uh, this uh, parallel. Uh, increasingly identified as national security threats, human security establishes the line between a crime against an individual and one against human dignity. Uh, realizing the danger in a culture of complicity that exists alongside a threat like human trafficking, policymakers are beginning to acknowledge the need to include elements of human security to create a more holistic national security policy. I shall try to make a, um, a immersion in, uh, in, a, in the slavery, uh, slavery world uh, to, to stress the idea that slavery um, is not considered a crime in an, uh, almost half of the countries in the world. 
slavery is illegal everywhere, um, we used to say. But um, the truth of this statement has been taken for granted for decades. And yet our new research reveals that almost half of all, all, all countries in the world have yet to actually make it a crime to enslave another human being. Uh, legal ownership of people was indeed abolished in all countries over the course of the last centuries. But in many countries, it, is, it has not been criminalized yet. In almost half of the world, um, in the world countries, there is no criminal law penalizing either slavery or the slave trade. In 94 countries, you cannot prosecute it and punish the criminal court for enslaving another human being. Um, there is a um, development of anti-slavery database mapping domestic legislation against international treaty obligation of all 193 United Nations member states. The database considers the domestic legislation of each country as well as the binding com commitments they have made through international agreements to prohibit form of human exploitation that fall under umbrella term modern slavery. This includes, includes forced labor, human trafficking, institutions and practices similar to slavery, servitude, uh, so slave trade and slavery itself. Also, 96 of all these countries have some form of domestic anti-trafficking legislation in place. Many of them appear to have failed to prohibit other types of human exploitation in their domestic law. Most notably uh, are um, for example, 94 states uh, appear not to have criminal legislation prohibiting slavery. 120 states appear not to have put in place penal provisions punishing forced labor. 180 states appear not to have en enacted legislative provisions criminalizing servitude. 170 states appear to have failed to criminalize the four, four institution and practices similar to slavery. In all these countries, there is no criminal law in place to punish people for subjecting people to this extreme force of, of forms of human exploitation. Abuses in uh, these cases can only be prosecuted indirectly through other offenses, such as human trafficking, if they are prosecuting at all. So slavery is far from being illegal uh, everywhere. A human security uh, perspective, a focus on the safety and freedom of individuals is often separated from what is considered national security matter. National security issues are traditionally understood as external threats against the state's ability to gov govern or uh, as states to state conflict. Often because of this disconnect, human security issues are not elevated to the same platform uh, of gov govern priority. Uh, the U United Nations General Assembly uh, resolution uh, 66 by uh, 290 notes that human security is an approach to assist member states in identifying and addressing widespread and cross-cutting challenges to the survival, livelihood, livelihood and dignity of their people. It calls for it calls for people-centered, comprehensive, context-specific and prevention-oriented response that strengthens the protection and empowerment of all people. Critics of human security argue that when the definition of national security becomes too broad or vague, it loses its potency, pot potency and ability to guide policy creation. Another uh, viewpoint sees the human security agenda as a means for member states of the United Nations to continuously intervene, threatening the 
sovereignty of states to legislate on matters of their own population. This debate is crucial to continue within academic and policymaking circles as the impact of globalization change, how uh, we interact and our ability to create better foreign policy for the future. Uh, the crucial part I would like to highlight is how women view security differently from, uh, is differently from traditional definitions. Their uh, women's criteria, criteria include the uh, effective institutions. Uh, 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 Um, so um, uh, I was saying that uh, uh, women's criteria include uh, effective institution, healthcare, justice, financial stability, agency, freedom of movement, concerns that are usually identified along the lines of human security. If policymakers are unable to find a way to end human security with this within the national security policy framework. They risk leaving out what, ha what half of the world's population define as security. So we have to redefine, to, 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 uh, to reorient our, our view on uh, uh, a more inclusive uh, uh, approach to human security. It is very important to understand women's perspective in the battle against human trafficking. According to global estimates of modern slavery, forced labor and forced marriage from the International Labor Organization, women and girls are disproportionately affected by forced labor, accounting for 99% 90, of victims in the commercial sex industry and 58% in other sectors. It is necessary to urge the inclusion of more women in conflict and post-conflict plans to increase awareness of the unique vulnerabilities they face. Um, in Romania, for example, we, we just uh, uh, released the first uh, uh, national plan for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, introducing uh, women peace and security uh, resolution. Uh, man, many countries uh, are still not, uh, um, uh, they still not have this um, uh, national plan yet. When countries are rebuilding after a conflict, for example, there is a danger of trafficking becoming entrenched if it is not confronted with an inclusive gender perspective. Preventing anti-trafficking, uh, preventive anti-trafficking measures should be considered both as life-saving interventions and as being aimed to preventing violence against women. So it is vital that trafficking be fully integrated in the Security Council's Women, Peace and Security Agenda, which prioritizes the importance of women's participation throughout the peace process from conflict prevention to peace building and peacekeeping. And it's well known that women are more diplomatic, more, uh, uh, more, they have a more uh, peaceful approach in solving the, uh, solve, in preventing and solving uh, the conflict and in, the, in uh, uh, keeping, uh, in peacekeeping operations. The Women, Peace and the Security Agenda is supported by four uh, pillars, prevention, participation, protection, and gender mainstreaming. But these pillars are the foundation for state to build their own national action plans of the issue. So trafficking needs to be fully integrated into these four pillars to ensure more effective human rights based and gender sensitive and trafficking responses and long term solution for survivors in conflict and post conflict setting. Human trafficking is a threat to national security because under undermines the rule of law deprives millions of their freedom and presents a threat threats to public safety and national security everywhere in the world. 
for uh, too long, uh, security solutions have not specifically addressed the impact of conflict on the protection and freedom of citizens, particularly women. But this is changing. Human security, human trafficking, uh, is one of the human security topics that has captured international attention for for the the long term. Pervasive effects uh, it can have on the rule of law and stability of a state's governance. So it is crucial to tightly waive the safety of individuals and the peripheral security concerns women identify, effective institutions, access to education, agency, gender-based violence, freedom of movement expression into the conversation of national security. If not the perception of individual humanity, it's practically deprived by, uh, by, uh, the, by securing half of the population. That's why this approach between uh, uh, human security and uh, human, uh, uh, human dignity, human trafficking, uh, modern slavery, all, all the, all the uh, form of uh, modern slavery, uh, it, it is very important to be reconsidered and to be um, uh, approached as a part of, uh, of uh, national security for uh, every country. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, really, you uh, said very well, uh, like uh, how uh, this new uh, or new concept not is not this is obviously new, but modern type of slavery you uh, elaborated uh, very well, and um, we know like uh, how how much it is uh, problematic for the whole uh, mankind. So thank you, ma'am, uh, for always uh, supporting us in uh, research activities. Uh, now, uh, I want to uh, invite uh, our keynote speaker as well as collaborator, uh, Dr. Pushpa Ayer. Uh, she is an associate professor in the Graduate School of Policy and Management at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. USF. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience in the field of conflict studies. She specializes in identity conflicts, non-state armed groups, civil wars, peace processes, and peace building in post-war societies. Uh, she is a long-term activist and advocate for the poor and marginalized communities in Gujarat, India. She is also the founding director of the Center for Conflict Studies, where she remains the editor-in-chief for the center's publications. Today's uh, her topic of deliberation is decolonizing the mind for decolonized governance. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Basista and the IIHSG for your welcome and this kind invitation to participate in this conference. I'm honored to not just deliver this keynote speech among such distinguished speakers, but also too as the director of the Center for Conflict Studies co-sponsor this conference. What an impressive list of speakers you have put together, Nandini. It's really very, very nice to see the full schedule there. I'm very much looking forward to the sessions that follow in these three days. I have in the past few years become very involved in efforts to diversify knowledge and diversifying knowledge to make it more inclusive of various sources and to equitably disseminate knowledge to decentralized power has driven me to study, teach, and practice decolonization of knowledge. So I define myself as an activist, practitioner, and academic, and in that order. And as an activist, I've begun to believe that decolonization is a human rights issue. As a practitioner, I believe that every step we take to make the world and its people more secure requires us to decolonize our approach. And as an academic, I believe that it is important and necessary for us to decolonize our minds, for us to decolonize knowledge. In fact, I believe that decolonizing the mind should be the first step we take if we want to decolonize. 
My topic, therefore, today, as Nandini mentioned, is decolonizing the mind for decolonized governance. So governance comes from the Latin word governare and the Greek verb gubernine. And I am going, I have completely butchered these pronunciations, I'm sure, but you get the idea. And it literally means to steer, which cynically put today is nothing but the desire to control, guide, or manipulate. Such a cynical view for me comes from the fact that the ideas of modern day governance is rooted in governance ideas, practices, and systems defined by colonial powers in formerly colonized countries like ours, India. Governance was something that colonial uh, powers had to learn and establish in places that were unfamiliar to them. They either incorporated some traditional indigenous practices or discarded them for new ways of governing. And these were often in opposition to the indigenous ways of governing. The fact is that formerly self-governing indigenous communities had the knowledge of governance that have over time been eroded or erased as colonial political and economic structures developed over the years, and these have gained more dominance. Governance models for security and peace have been hierarchical and top-down, emphasizing the centrality of the state over those of the people, that is the people who need to be governed. Now, of course, over time, these concepts of global governance or these traditional notions of governance have included a broadened definition of security, that is human security and peace, and one that is more just and humane. The broadening of these concepts has made it possible for us to think about a governance system that is more inclusive, such as national and state governments being included, nonprofits, and even civil society institutions. So governance is a process and therefore the type of governance that involves all levels of society would represent a more deliberative democracy. And I'm taking the idea of deliberative democracy from Habermas's deliberative democracy theory, which tells us that deliberation is central to decision-making and it's not voting. You know, when we think about democracy, we just think it's voting, but it's really about how um, this decision-making, this collaborative decision-making happens that is through deliberation and discussion. This means that all involved in governing can have an equal say in decisions made. So if you take a quick examination of some of the UN governance policies, the more recent ones and practices, it shows that there's much effort being made to uh, in various spheres to include non-governmental civil society and indigenous voices. However, a question that is raised by many is how much of these groups are really included in decision-making? For example, how much of indigenous knowledge is included in our efforts to battle the global crisis of climate change? You know, given that the indigenous communities are some of the ones that are most uh, close to nature, to the earth. How is it that health practices that our colonized minds cannot accept are dismissed as witchcraft or harmful? Gender or sexuality as a spectrum or various sexual practices are still categorized as criminal in many parts of the world. Persons and institutions of certain races, religion, nationality are not included often in decision-making processes. They're not empowered. Here is an example from Afghanistan that I like to always use. And this comes from Maliha Chisti. She was the former director of the Hague Appeal for Peace at the UN. And she says in her TED talk, as a researcher of Afghanistan, she says, we were in charge of running the country, help, private sector, government, media, we had authority and decision-making power without knowing anything of the local context. We became the architects for the future of the Afghani people. We conceptualized, implemented, supervised, evaluated, wrote policies, revised curriculum, restructured government, judiciary, security sector, wrote national laws, imposed elections, revised the constitution, planned the economy for the next 12 years without any domestic content. And this example represents the term coloniality, the mindset with which we enter former colonized countries. The term coloniality emerges from colonialism. It is a power that comes from an invisible part of history. And that's how complex it gets. When we develop theories of change, 
toolkits, approaches, et cetera, and then we implement them or ask that recipient communities implement them, we are furthering this notion of colonized governance. Even when we say ground up theories, we are the ones who have developed them after everything we have learned from working with the communities, right? And we are still producing and distributing knowledge the way our colonized or our westernized educations have, uh, education has taught us. Nugugi Valtyong, um, and we'll talk about him again in this, uh, in this short period of time, says that the production of knowledge, it comes from cooperation. It is communication, it is language, it is expression of a relation between human beings, and it is specifically human. This colonization of the mind, not just for the colonized, but for those of us who are, you know, uh, also for uh, those of us who are colonized, is it continues to play out in terms of who is superior and who is not. It also plays out in the way we cannot deal with cultural differences within racial differences or any kinds of identity differences or, you know, and that means ethnicity, nationality or more. We talk about, you know, being diverse and inclusive, but really diverse and inclusive is only when you can work with someone who is completely different from you who speaks differently from you, who thinks differently from you and experiences differently from you. You see, I'm getting to the point that, you know, if governance, if you really want good governance, we have to think about a governance system that's truly inclusive. Truly inclusive means you're working and making decisions in a deliberative way through, you know, uh, decision making process that involves discussion with people who are completely different from the way we think about things. And this has become very acute now, given the COVID pandemic. Never have our governance systems received so much attention for how well they can perform. At such times, and we haven't really done well, right? And at such times, one would expect that the government would recognize the need and importance to collaborate rather than manage alone. However, at these moments of crisis, what we have seen is governments across the world becoming more and more autocratic in how they deal with the crisis. I'll talk about the US, you know, which is where I live now for over 20 years. The US government, for example, at a very critical point in the pandemic, sought to distance itself from the WHO. And I think one of our previous speakers spoke about this. Key information from the Center for Disease Control is not shared. And this is controlled knowledge dissemination. Knowledge is not equally disseminated to all. Ways of treating individuals come from the health training that many of the uh, health uh, you know, service uh, personnel have received from westernized education. The opposition to vaccines, for example, is dealt with massive authoritarian decisions leading to more divisions in society. Uh, now let's just say, yes, true, the pandemic is a crisis that is new to everyone and a challenge that no government has faced before. But I argue that the fundamental problem is not that we have a new global crisis, but that we are so colonized in our minds and our ways that our approaches, that we still assume that knowledge and skills should be and are invariably bestowed upon a few. And only they have the right to make those decisions. And all other knowledge, you know, other knowledge is not just invalid, but that they need to be eliminated, erased. And this results in those nations, institutions, and communities that are marginalized further and further away from this governance decision-making processes. And we see the same kind of authoritarian and top-heavy or top-down approaches with other crises that are happening, immigration issues, social issues like race, ethnic, or minority discrimination, climate crisis, immigration, uh, and economic crises. So why are some of the practices that came way before colonization or those adopted by colonizers, for example, like the panchayat system in India, look less and like, less like the original systems? And this is because the past in some ways has to be annihilated, erased completely by what, again, Nugugi Vatyong is whom I'm going to refer to, and he's a Kenyan writer and academic and author of Decolonizing the Mind. He calls it the cultural bomb of colonization. The effect of the cultural bomb of colonization, he says, is to erase people's belief in the following, their names, languages, environment, their heritage, struggle or unity, their capacities, and ultimately in themselves. 
In short, what I'm saying is that I, as a person uh, and my mind have also been colonized because a lot of it is the knowledge that we have comes from everything that we knew before being erased. And in my case, everything that I should have learned from my ancestors. It therefore does not qualify me right now to suggest what we need to do to decolonize unless I undergo the process of decolonizing my mind, which is an ongoing journey and I'm nowhere near completion. So all I share here today are my own personal reflections and I urge you to do the same. This colonized ways of governing come from a colonized mind, as I've said before. So let us try to understand a little bit about these colonized minds. The mind is controlled by the invisible strings which the colonizer holds. This comes from westernized education. The control over mind is always long lasting and not easily removable. So Tunisian decolonizing activist, Albert Mimimi wrote, in order for the colonizer or the person having power to be a complete master, it's not enough for him to be so. In actual fact, he must also believe in its legitimacy. And in order for that legitimacy to be complete, it is not enough for the colonized to be a slave. He must also accept the role. This is about asymmetry of power. And as Dasco, Brazilian philosopher and linguist says, both the colonizer and the colonized may be unaware of their roles in the process of colonization of the mind. He further adds that both can participate in the process voluntarily or involuntarily. And Steve Biko, who's a South African anti-apartheid activist has said, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Now let's replace the word colonizer and colonized with powerful leaders and minoritized communities, marginalized communities, and you get the picture of how a system of control and manipulation control uh, continues with many current government systems. And this is my main argument is that it doesn't matter how much ever the newer um, or newer or the more recent, I mean, governance processes talk about inclusivity, talk even about the word in use the word decolonization. The question really is if our minds are that colonized, can we really be decolonized in the ways we approach governance? And the main thrust of a colonized mind is to create a center and a periphery. The center comprises of individuals, institutions, and nations that have the power to make the decisions, but also to decide how and when they want to be inclusive. So this is very symbolic of how we are seeing what's happening with the pandemic and the climate crisis and everything. Who's at the center? Who's making those decisions? And when do they decide to bring in other perspectives? Not only when do they decide when to bring other perspectives, but they're also able to limit the extent to which they want to be inclusive. So at any time they can say, we don't want these other perspectives, or we don't want to include them in our decision-making process. And those in the periphery, you know, those individuals, institutions, and nations that are seen in the periphery are those who have no rights and the power to participate in the governance decision-making process. The resulting governance system and process is not deliberative democracy. It is centralized with both power and knowledge. And I make the argument oftentimes that people use the right words now because now they know how to talk about these things. So they may say decolonized ways, or they may say more inclusive, or they may say decentralized you know, forms of governance. But yet, if our minds are that colonized, I argue, how could we truly be decolonized? So our first step is therefore this decolonization of the mind. So the decolonized approach that would involve us challenging this current center periphery, I would call it decentering, And that's what most scholars call it. And that is expanding the center by inviting others into the space. It would involve us defocusing power and knowledge from those who are currently hold that kind of power in the center. Involving these multiple perspectives at the center will result in a governance system that is inclusive, equitable, and one that addresses the needs of all members of the community. And I say that in today's uh, world where we are so divided and that there is so much of differences amongst us in terms of how to govern, it would really be worthwhile to focus on first, can we decolonize our minds so we can truly hear each other 
those different perspectives, especially the perspectives that are very different from the way we think about things. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you, uh, ma'am, or Pushpadi. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I think, uh, don't take me otherwise, uh, decolonizing mind, what I think is a utopian concept, we can't uh, ever achieve that. Even we are celebrating 75 years of independence in India. Anyways, uh, thanks uh, for your speech. Uh, I hope uh, your speech will make people think in a new way. Uh, let's see, that is the main purpose of this conference to uh, make people aware as well as uh, get new ideas for thinking because many times uh, we scholars become uh, stereotyped. So please be stereotyped and don't write stereotyping uh, papers. Uh, that is the main focus of this conference. Thank you for being with us as collaborator, as a keynote speaker. Uh, so without delay, we want to uh, invite our uh, next uh, special addressee, uh, Professor Dr. Alka Parik. Uh, she is a gold medalist in uh, MA Economics from Mumbai University and holds PhD uh, from Department of Agriculture and Allied Economics, Cornell University, USM. Uh, she has worked in Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, Mumbai School of Economics and Public Policy. And at present, uh, she is professor at uh, Dhirubhai Ambani Institute, uh, Gujarat. Her research addresses various aspects of economic development, including agriculture, poverty, employment, food, and water security. She also gives her time to NGOs like Uthyan, Ahmedabad, and Uplift Pune to further her commitment to the field. For a short period, she was also Dean Research of Amity University, Mumbai, and Director of Amity Institute of Liberal Arts, Amity University, Mumbai. Her today's talk will be on good governance, a necessary and often a sufficient condition for attaining human security. Over to you, ma'am. I just wanted to tell you first that um, uh, I wanted to take this theme of the workshop a little bit further because this is an inaugural session. And we are talking about governance and human security together. So that's why I chose the title that I did, that good governance is definitely a necessary condition, definitely a necessary condition for attaining human security. At times, it can be sufficient condition also. So I just want to present my thoughts on this topic and um, I will share my screen now with your permission. Yes, ma'am, you can. Okay, so um, the, I always feel slightly uncomfortable putting the screen full because then I lose control. So uh, if you can see it like this, then I would rather proceed like this. Is that yes, ma'am, we can see it. You can see it. Okay, great. Okay, so. Uh, Necessary and maybe a sufficient condition. I had first said often, I changed it to maybe because it's not always the case, but I feel that it is a case many times. Uh, so uh, why is human security, according to me, is very closely related with good governance? Um, I feel that it is not, you don't have to look far to understand that. Um, if you take the example of Syria, Syria had a very corrupt government and very cruel government too. So when a government is very corrupt and very cruel at the same time, the citizens are going to be dissatisfied. So I think it was around 2011 that there was some kind of protest which started erupting in the streets. The government tried to clamp it down, but then by then the uh, other people had taken it over who were called the terrorists or whatever. And then within just months, they could not even manage this terrorism. Within just months, it became a full-blown war. I mean, not being able to manage a situation to the extent that war is declared shows the height of bad governance. And then just look at what happened to human security. The accounts today in 2022 
uh, almost 10 to 11 years after the war began, says that almost 90% of the population is food insecure. It also talks about, uh, I mean, they say that millions of people have been killed, millions of people have tried to migrate outside, and it's a country which is completely in shambles, all started because there was a government which was very badly governing the nation. Okay. The other example is Myanmar. The army likes to take control by force of this country again and again. And democracy is never allowed to prevail. So what happens is people anyway are unhappy because this government is very inefficient, very cruel, and at the same time, very biased biased against the minorities. So look what happened to the Rohingyas and how hundreds and thousands of them had to migrate to Bangladesh and still living in extremely miserable conditions over there. Then now they have started some of the refugees who have been protesting against Myanmar government have started now coming into Mizoram and Manipur in India. And we are providing them some kind of refuge. But the thing is, just look at the quality of life of these people. So a cruel government, a corrupt government can completely uh, destroy a nation and its happiness. Even when the government is not always corrupt and cruel, Kazakhstan had a government which is kind of inefficient more than anything else. Fuel prices increase and other prices anyway. People lose their patience. There are protests on the street and then the government clamps down. And there is so much as far as the suffering of the human security is concerned. Hong Kong, the government tries to just impose its own will on people. People are unhappy. When they become unhappy, they protest. When they protest, they are arrested. The wealth are seized. The colleges are closed and things like that. What happens to human security? Governance and security are very closely related. Very closely. Give an example of bad governance and there you would see human security is at threat. There are other implications also. If the government is corrupt and inefficient, as we find many governments in, say, Africa, you would find that the growth of that nation suffers like anything. Those nations always remain very poor because that government does not know what to do to make the nation grow. For that also, you require some base, some good policies, which they do not have. I wanted to take an example of Oman over here. As far as Oman was concerned, till 1970s, first of all, oil was not yet properly discovered. Oman was a very poor nation. It had, I think uh, they said that they had only three primary schools by 1970s. It had no colleges and uh, uh, it had just one hospital, just one hospital in the entire country. The network of the roads was very, very poor. And then Sultan Kabus took over. When Sultan Kabus took over, Sultan Kabul, Kabus was one of this very, very able, capable administrator. When he took over, and oil also, of course, oil money started helping, but the government policies made sure that the oil money starts coming to the government. That was another thing that Sultan Kabus did. And look at Oman today. Oman sits in one of the, uh, I mean, he, uh, if you look at the human development index, it qualifies in the very highly developed human development. Okay, from a nation which was so poor to a nation which is now sitting in the group of the nations which are the 20 biggest nations of the world. Okay, I mean, 20 richest nations of the world. That is the journey that you can make when you have good governance. So that's why I said, maybe not just necessary, but sufficient also. It proved to be sufficient, right? As far as Oman was concerned. 
Singapore. I mean, you all know how it progressed under Lee. It was chucked out after the British left and after the Second World War. And then now it is sitting in the, it is a first world nation. I mean, it is so divided. Okay. But there was one more thing that I wanted to point out that good governance does not equal to democracy. And that's what Singapore and Oman have to do. Because none of them were democratic nations. Uh, Oman is a kingdom because it was uh, owned by the Sultan. And uh, Singapore had an autocratic leader. He was not elected democratically. But they developed and became the first world nations. Russia. Russia, USSR, communism always looked at, I mean, uh, the entire roots of communism were, if you know that slogan, workers break five, uh, through uh, your chains and you have nothing to lose. Yeah? So, I mean, uh, these are the workers whom they worked for. They worked for the people so that they get enough food to eat, so that they have a nice house to live in, although very small. Russia always gives very small houses as far as urban areas are concerned. If you look at the Stalin area buildings, um, education was something which was made available to every single person. So yes, there was cruelty. Yes, there were people who were killed, whoever tried to question the government. But the common person on the street who did not want anything but just a peaceful living was the person who actually got the right to employment, the right to food, the right to housing, everything that a decent living demanded. And that is the reason why when USSR broke up, the Central Asian nations, uh, which were under them, I mean, I'm talking about Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and uh, Turkmenistan, everybody. So all of these were very, very sad that they actually broke up from Russia. And even today, when you talk to them, they say that the golden era of their nations was when the communists were there because everything was running nice. Russians were, I mean, the Russians, even when USSR was there, yes, it was a corrupt society. We know that. But as I said, somehow, somewhere, they made sure that their population gets at least all the basic facilities to lead a decent existence. And that has made many of its citizens happy who were not very prosperous nations, like, as I said, uh, Kazakhstan and Tajikistan, especially. So these are the nations which actually were not very happy that communism broke up. Okay, So good governance assures some kind of decent living. So once again, it is something which is necessary and often a sufficient condition. On the contrary, just because a nation is a democratic nation, there is no guarantee that it would be governed well. Yeah, democracy can be corrupt. I mean, talk to us, we know that in India. Violent, you know that in many other nations, now including India also, somebody was talking about the uh, rights of the minorities and things like that. Uh, well, we have a lot of violence going on out here. Division, once again, India is a very, very classic example of that. And because of all that, very quiet, very, very chaotic. So democracy also can be badly governed. And as I said, India is unfortunately uh, an example of that in some ways. I would not say many ways, but in some ways it is. So uh, it's not that, that if a nation is democratic nation, it would definitely grow. It doesn't. I mean, we didn't grow. We were growing by Hindu growth of rate uh, till 1980s. And then because of recession hit us in 2011, um, our democracy could not save us from recession. We still had very low growth rates, uh, around 4% to 5%. So, I mean, democracy is not something which always assures that you would get good standard of living. 
but good governance can assure that. Okay. Um, so nations which have followed the basic needs approach, which is food, clothing, and shelter, and of late, they talk about health and education also. Nations which have followed the basic needs approach um, are the nations where the people have been able to get decent standard of living. Like for example, when Sri Lanka got its independence, Sri Lanka decided to spend almost nine to 10% of its GDP just on providing food to its people. And it was successful. Today, unfortunately, uh, things have changed. But when I say today, I mean now, it, it has changed. But for a long period of time, Sri Lanka was sitting uh, uh, above many other South Asian nations because it had followed the basic needs approach. Uh, but at the same time, I also wanted to point out that the governance should not be just efficient, but it should be fair also. Yeah. So, I mean, you can have a government which is very efficient, but which is very biased against minorities, the way it happened in Germany under Hitler. So, I mean, it wasn't very efficient also, but I mean, at least there was some growth and people started supporting Hitler because the economy had started created, creating some jobs and everything after the First World War, but it wasn't fair at all. So when the government is not fair, even if it is efficient, human security is not ensured. So good governance should also be equitable. I mean, that is also a characteristic of good governance, okay? Um, okay, now I wanted to take an example of a nation uh, which is, uh, according to me, a very unique nation in many ways. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about it. I'm talking about Bhutan. So this is one of the famous uh, monasteries of Bhutan that I'm showing you. I mean, this is one of the iconic uh, monasteries. And when you say Bhutan, people generally give this monastery as the icon of Bhutan. So that's why I've taken it. Uh, so Bhutan has higher HDI than any South Asian nation. Um, it it uh, competes with Sri Lanka, but that's about it. All the others, including India, are below Bhutan. Bhutan is government has made sure it's a, it follows the basic needs approach. Now, food, of course, it makes sure that everybody gets it. It has a tiny population. So it can, at times, uh, manage to get that really well. What I wanted to show you was the shelter. Just look at this beautiful shelter. So the Bhutanese government actually helps people in upkeeping their buildings, you know? So the paintings are on, often done by the government. The government at times gives them allowance for housing and things like that. So people have very beautiful houses to live in. Not always. There are places where you get the houses which are old and which are dilapidated, but you would find that this particular way of making housing is always there. And people generally have at least something which is not a slum you don't find the Bhutanese population living in slums, okay? So the, there is housing that they have provided for. And as far as clothing is concerned, because basic needs approach is food, clothing, and shelter. As far as clothing is concerned, Bhutan has a national dress. Just as we have a school dress, they have a national dress. And most of the times when people go out, they wear that. So what happens is that I was talking to our driver when we were going there as to how many dresses they have. He says, you don't need more than four to five because whenever he goes out, he always wears this. Your demand for clothing anyway comes down because most of the people are wearing the national dress. So you have enough resources because your population is using much lesser resources. So you have enough resources to provide clothing to all your people. So that is another thing which Bhutan does. Um, I'll come to water a little later. The other thing which is unique about Bhutan is the health services are first, they try to treat you by the medicines, which is the traditional Bhutanese medicine. So they use, they, they are coming from the, they are a kingdom of Himalaya, right? 
So I mean, there are so many herbs which is available in Himalayas and they are aware of the medicinal value of that. So the first medicines that you go with, which is the primary health care. So the primary health care is mostly driven with the Bhutanese uh, herbal medicine, traditional medicines. And then the other medicines which are available in the uh, uh, PHC are the generic medicines. So they believe that there is no need for people to go for branded medicines. The generic medicines will be available at a much lesser cost. All the shops of the government would be always stocking the generic medicines. So people would get access to medicines at very low cost. Okay, so these are the things that they are following as far as the basic needs approach is concerned. Um, there is one more thing which uh, uh, the, the Bhutanese do, and for that, I will first have to take you here rather than here. Uh, in the 1970s, when Bhutan started uh, talking about the, uh, the, I mean, making its nation's well being better, the king said, that I'm not too convinced that uh, GDP should be the index which should reflect my country. Because we are not the people who believe our philosophy of life is not that, that you should keep accumulating material wealth. So why should I have an index which sees how, at what pace I'm multiplying my material wealth? I don't want to multiply my material wealth. That is not the goal of a human life. The goal of a human life is spiritual growth. So he came up with this measure, which is called Gross National Happiness, GNH. Gross na National Happiness was defined in a very minute way with so many indicators. I think they have something like 100 indicators for that. So they use that index to define that gross national happiness. And that is psychological well-being, that is environmental well-being, that is the well-being of the culture, that is your heritage, everything is being protected. And then, of course, you're happy. Okay, so that is the whole uh, philosophy with which Bhutan went ahead. And now see how it is, it is implementing that uh, as far as its environmental security is concerned. So Bhutan, to date, restricts the number of tourists. Indians are also restricted in the sense that after a certain number, you can't go. But as far as foreigners are concerned, even tourist visa is not very easy to come by. We do not need a visa, so we throng there. But it's not very easy to come by as far as other foreign tourists are concerned. Uh, then environment is also protected by restricting the number of cars. The, so they do not, uh, cars are first extremely expensive over there. And every year you can import only so many cars. They do not have manufacturing plant of cars. So you can import car and cars are imported only of certain numbers and not more than that. Once again, as far as industries are concerned, they do not allow any industries which can be polluting the environment too much because they belong to this extremely fragile Himalayan atmosphere. And they know what can happen if the Himalayas go mad, you know? So they are extremely careful about protecting their environment. And uh, primary education is free over there. Uh, they, the students study up to 12th standard. After that, depending on your grades, you are given admission in college. So if you do not receive a certain amount of grade, then uh, you are not allowed to take college education. So that is the reason when you look at the educational indices, you will find that Bhutanese are not always doing too well because the government makes sure that only those people take education who are actually capable of going further. All the others who are not that very capable are uh, given vocational training and they pursue many, many different kinds of entrepreneurship. So this is how they have designed it. You might agree or disagree. The most important thing is that in gross national, I mean, the World Happiness Index, again and again, Bhutan has always been in the first 20. That is the thing which matters. And so, as far as human security is concerned, 
human security is best reflected by the happiness that the human being feels. And if a nation, which is not a very prosperous nation by its own choice, by its own choice, it is not a prosperous nation, it decides to pursue some other things and still its population is a very happy population that says something about good governance and human security. Uh, and now I come to the last example that I wanted to take, and this is of Denmark. Uh, Denmark is a nation which, as you know, in HDI comes extremely high always. And as far as the World Happiness Index is concerned, it is invariably in first five, often the first. So what is Denmark doing? So Denmark is always, as I said, in top five, only 2% of its employees have to work very long hours. Everybody else works for eight hours. There are facilities for working from home. There are facilities for flexi work hours. And this is even before the pandemic struck. That is how Denmark has been working, allowing the work-life balance. They spend around two thirds of their day, which is 16 hours, eating, sleeping, and indulging in leisurely pursuits. 96% of the people report having friends or relatives they can count on in times of trouble. Ask yourself that if you have to take a survey of all the people around you, would we find everybody who would say that I know that if I fall, somebody or the other would come to give me support. I mean, they are 96% of the people there are saying that they have that kind of support. Uh, that also, of course, reflects as far as human security is concerned. Um, air quality in Denmark is also better than those that club of OECD nations. 80% of adults aged between 25 to 64 have completed the upper secondary education. So this is also like Bhutan. You don't force them to study further and further if they are not good at it. But everybody is educated, everybody is skilled, everybody has an employment which is gainful for them. When the dens are at work, they enjoy high degree of flexibility. They can often choose when they can start that working day and have the option of working from home. I already talked about this. When you look at what is important to Danish citizens, jobs and income are much lower. This is once again, the Bhutanese family philosophy also, but they list health, education, and environment and work-life balance as something which is far, far more important for them. We have something to learn from these guys as far as philosophy of life is concerned, as far as governance is concerned. So they say we don't buy big houses or big cars. We like to spend our money on socializing with others. That is a day for you. Know? And uh, the days pay very high taxes. But remember, Denmark is a welfare state. So health, education, everything comes free. So they know that. So they know that when they are paying, they are getting back also. They don't complain. Complaining is also part of unhappiness, guys. These guys are happy because they actually accept the kind of taxes that are also being paid. Okay. So uh, now all that I wanted to say in conclusion is that, that note that in both these case studies, the governors played a very important role. Both are governed very well and that led to satisfactory deliverance of services leading to high level of satisfaction. True, the role of the philosophy of life cannot be underestimated. But good governance and unique public policies make these nations what they are. Happy nations. I repeat once again, happy nations. Uh, that is why I say that probably good governance is both necessary and sufficient condition for attaining high level of human security. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I think... Uh directly uh, maybe uh, we can't say many thing to many persons who are uh, in the upper hierarchical position but with the example of others we can say all these things like 
in my childhood my father used to say see the report card of your uh, neighborhood girl who is not having resources like you like good teachers and uh, food every day but see her report card uh, these we can say i think uh, for small nations also you can see the gross national happiness index and bhutan was uh, the first uh, uh, in the index uh, where, where uh, like uh, we, we, if we consider about uh, about the resources maybe uh, it is not having much resourceful resources are uh, like india or other big nations are having like in indonesia and etc so uh, thank you ma'am uh, for wonderful speech uh, now without uh, delaying i want to invite our next uh, special addressee uh, professor dr sanjay k bharadwaj uh, he is former chairperson center for south asian studies and former director energy studies program school of international studies jawaharlal nehru university uh, new delhi india and joint secretary association of asia scholars he did mphil and phd from jnu itself he was a uh, su si fellow 2018 at university of delaware usm uh, cass icssr fellow 2013 at chinese academy of social science beijing china asia fellows 2010 11 at university of dhaka bangladesh lse uh, srt fellow 2009 10 at london school of economics and political science london U united kingdom fellow at youth exchange program ministry of foreign affairs of japan tokyo in 2002 3 uh, he wrote many books on south asia india's foreign policy and identity politics uh, today uh, he will speak on emerging threats to human security in south asia over to you sir thank you dr nandini uh, for giving this opportunity and Uh, giving a nice introduction of mine i am a teacher in a university and i also extend my thanks to professor alka parik that she has covered a lot of things about south asia that i i was uh, she has created a background that i am supposed to uh, speak so thank you very much uh, professor Al alka parik uh, uh, for discussing south asia we all are aware that you know the south asia we are part of common ecological organic system so you cannot uh, you cannot see any country in isolation either it is bhutan or nepal or india or pakistan or bangladesh and all these countries because being a part of common ecological organic system we share resources we share mountain we share rivers and all that and the we also have a uh, uh, spill over impact on each other's uh, socio political uh, lives so uh, what i'm going to discuss today's uh, today's about the human security in south asia the emerging threats that i will specifically cover the emerging areas what what are the emerging threats that uh, the south asian societies are going to face and are facing there are you know there are many aspects which leads to socio political commotions in south asia from uh, from in the post colonial period we are well aware and that post colonial legacies that uh, the earlier speaker was also talking about the mi mindset the the legacies that that is still dominating the uh, the 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 discourse in uh, south asian people as well as in between the south asian nation and most of the problems that you will find uh find is still uh, is still uh is the is the result uh, result of the colonial uh, legacies or you can say the partisan politics and what it led it led the nations the, the nations to draw to draw or to make the nations in different parameters and different uh, uh on different criteria and those are the factors that is still dominating creating lot of human security threat as uh professor alka parik has also talked about that the 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 concern of the most vulnerable uh, person or the section should be addressed by the state and that belongs to the governance the issue of governance and the governance is very much closely associated with the human security so my uh, my my simple submission is that that how how a society like south asia had been colonized for more than 200 years uh still still are trapped uh, in 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 the different construct 
uh, along along the different uh, parameters. Like the first, I would come that still the South Asian politics is dominating between the uh, the, the the notion of nation that notion of nation that one nation is advancing the inclusive notion of nation trying to bring all the people together and trying to address all the sections creeds castes religious people all together uh, uh, into it, its fold but other way you can see that the some of the nations in south asia are still advancing the notion of exclusiveness that they are excluding the others others in the name of race or in the name of religion, and they are consolidating the national identities along the uh, are, are along the primordial uh, constraints. Or you can say on the religion, on the race, on the ethnicity, on the on the language. And what is happening? Being a uh, being a, uh, a a a very uh, homogeneous, uh, uh, or or, uh, or you you can say being a uh, uh, a different uh, cultural or being the diversity of re this region that the vulnerable sections or vulnerable people's concerns are not addressed. And what is what it is leading towards, you can see there are a number of examples that I'm not going to very specific examples that how the exclusive notion of nation and the inclusive notion of nation had been dominating in Sri Lankan politics. You can see that how they have gone for the CLE uh, nationalistic constructs, how Pakistan is, was talking about the Islamic nationalistic constructs, and that is also dominating these days in other South Asian countries. And what finally it is leading towards, it is leading that the between the people and between the societies and different between the different sections, the, the, the nature of relationship had been developed on the basis of subordinate and subordinate. That one section has become subordinate and uh, dominated by their creed, by their caste, by their uh, religion, and and uh, they are subordinating the minority communities. That earlier speaker was also talking about the concerns of minority communities, and these minority communities has become basically uh, that, that has become a subordinate in 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 number of the sense, and this was this is also creating a lot of problems of separatism or insurgency and, and different conflicts that I'm going to discuss uh, in, in my next uh, uh, presentation. The third, what is happening, and you can see that uh, the, the, that uh, particularly the, 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 uh, the, the wave of rightist, uh, uh, rightism in, in South Asian countries are dominating on all over the South Asian countries in that the majority minority interface and the issue of proportional sharing of the state resources is dominating the discourse. You can see that all the South Asian countries are under the trap of the majority minority uh, discourse for political and regime security. In this political regime security, what the majority are uh, are basically uh, cultivating a majoritarian discourse in different forums. I would come, I would discuss that how they are symbolizing the different uh, uh, different ethos and principles for to appease the majority communities to remain in power and how the minority rights uh, uh, rights are suppressed, minority communities uh, rights or, or sharing of the resources are, uh, are, are under attack. This is the third and the fourth very important aspect, again, the issue of statehood and pro provincial autonomy, which leads to uh, ethno-nationalistic segregations in all the South Asian countries. You take example like, like in Pakistan, uh, you take Pakistan, there are contentions at different layers. There are contentions between urban and tribal. You can see that Punjabis and the Baluchis, how they are conflicting with each other because of the issue of statehood or provincial autonomy. They have they have been demo, uh, demanding for uh, for provincial autonomy, and the uh, the the Punjabi Mohajir country they are dominating the discourse in Pakistan politics in last 70 years. You can see there are urban rural divides between the Sindhis and Punjabis that. Uh, the Punjabis, again, there are complaints from the Sindhi communities or rural uh, 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 Sindhi communities. They are complaining the Punjabi uh, uh, dominates. And there are also conflicts between the urban and uh, urban, like Punjabis and Mohajir. These, these uh, state food or provincial autonomy are also dominating in case of uh, Sri Lanka. You see that how, how the northern uh, province of Sri Lanka, uh, they, they have been fighting for last three decades and how the, uh, the Sri Lankan economy had been uh, under attack and the society and polity had been under attack. This, uh, uh, the, the, these are the, 
the, the characteristics in other South Asian countries, you can take case of Bangladesh also, the CST people were complaining about a uh, number of issues that how it had been uh, dominating uh, the discourse in South Asian countries. So what is further uh, uh, happening that this, uh, uh, the, these constructs, the different constructs along the, uh, along the religious or ethnic lines between the minority and majority, between inclusive notion of nation and ex exclusive notion of nation, that what, what is, what, what ha it has become a phenomena that the, uh, the, the populist politics had been uh, now dominating, the populist leadership and populist politics and, and that is only appeasing a sections of the society, a majority sections of the society, bringing and giving a, uh, giving a, uh, uh, you can say the incentives to the majority communities to remain for their, uh, or to remain in power or for the regime security. And what the, what further they are doing, they are basically, they have created dichotomies within the society dichotomies on different parameters, like the dichotomy between the value and the goals. You take the case, case of Bangladesh, like the dichotomy has been systematically uh, created within, within Bangladesh society that the government is doing very well on economic parameters, that Bangladesh economy has been uh, has been growing very faster while uh, a particular regime uh, is in power. The Bangladesh, uh, they are performing in, in their uh, GDP and, and uh, other, other, other uh, uh, index, human security index and all that in case of Bangladesh. So we do not bother about the values, the values of democracy. It is, if it is participatory democracy, if it is an inclusive democracy, if it is, we do not bother unless until this government is performing very well in economic economic uh, 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 level. So this in the creating this dichotomy, the goals are dominating the values. And while the values are undermined, it means that human rights are undermined, human security are undermined, that you can't address the, uh, the, the concerns of the most vulnerable section in the society while you are undermining the values. Uh, there are also uh, the dichotomy has been created in other South Asian countries between the political de uh, democracy and, and the economic development that I'm, I'm talking about that political democracy and that if the country is, is, is do uh, doing very well on economic uh, development and if, uh, if a particular regime is transforming a society economically, we do not bother whether that, uh, that uh, the party or the, that particular uh, uh, leader is is has also developed the authoritarian tendencies in their functioning. So that that, that is also further dichotomized. What is happening? The third uh, in this dichotomy, the third part uh, that I understand, which is my uh, observations about my analysis about the South Asian countries, that the uh, the third dichotomy is created between the political participation and national integration on the name of national integrations on the name of the, the national integrations the the voices of the most vulnerable the voices of the minority communities had been suppressed on the uh, on the on the question of national integrations and the proper political participations had not been given. And while the proper political participation, or you can say that the voices of the most vulnerable are not hard in decision making and policy making process, you cannot ensure that the parameters of the human security will be uh, will be protected and will be taken care in that particular society. And you can see all the South Asian countries are basically moving and suppressing the political participation, the ethos of political participation on the name of national integration. And what further it is, uh, what further it is happening that, uh, that the further dichotomy has been created between the liberty and equality in, in order to ensure regime stability that you do not have that kind of liberty in the, on the name of, uh, of equality. So this is all happening in South Asian countries that these are the emerging areas, emerging threats, and in this emerging threats, the, 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 the concerns of the most vulnerable sections are, under, uh, are, uh, are not addressed, and they have been undermined uh, for, on the name of these uh, economic performance or national integrations and, uh, and on the name of uh, 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 equality and all that. And uh, this, uh, this is creating a commotion among 
between the societies on the name of autonomy or you can say provincial autonomy or uh, uh, what 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 is further impact is happening that because of these kinds of problems that three major internal security threats are emerging one is terrorism another is fundamentalism and third is insurgency and the states are further to counter to address these issues of terrorism fundamentalism or like in the countering terrorism or defying fundamentalism or curbing uh, insurgency in these countries they are also making they are also becoming uh, 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 or they, they have started behaving like a hard power in that and that uh, keeping the the concerns of the wider society uh, wider uh, sections of the society why these uh, the, these things are happening i'll uh, i'll give you one very 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 specific up amount uh, account on that because uh, the democracy and development and or you can say uh, the human security there i'm trying to that how the radicalizations are taking place and this radicalizations in the society on the name of majority in the name of religion on the name of uh, 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 name of uh, basically a pro a national integrity that the radicalizations or fundamentalist uh, uh, tendencies are developing in uh, uh, at different layers of the society i have categorized is in th three categories at the macro level i would say that the socio political elites uh, socio political elites are symbolizing the polity and society and the constitutions on the to uh, to appease the majority discourse or uh, uh, to 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 uh, uh, to make a, a, themselves into uh, to remain in power basically for the regime security and they they are they have ruined the secular and inclusive notion of nation or, or characteristic of the society in all the south asian countries you see that how the constitution of bangladesh had been changed over the years they have sacrificed their lives uh, for secularism for democracy for Bengali nationalism and how the, uh, the it has been further Islamized uh, over the years. Uh, and today, Bangladesh, the state religion of Bangladesh is also Islam. You see in the case of Pakistan, you can also see in the case of Sri Lanka that how they have, uh, they have gone for a particular language. And some tendencies you can also witness in case of India also, that how the government is symbolizing the, the uh, symbolizing the polity and the society uh, and the constitutions to appease the uh, the majority communities in 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 these countries so i at the while you are investigating and you know that uh, role of the petrodollar and role of the other uh, uh, financial institutions or, or or you can say the charity organizations they are also playing or social organizations they are also playing very important role at the macro level to, to, to symbolizing the polity and society uh, uh, for, for to gain uh, to protect the uh, the rights of the majority not the minority communities why it is happening because at the major level while you are in uh, you are investigating that there is decline of scholarship decline of in scholarship we actually we fail to uh, to we fail to teach the inclusive ethos of the society in all the south asian countries take bangladesh take in uh, Sri Lanka or India or all that, and uh, in fact we have uh, the, we also fail to, or, or you can say that the scholars or the Malvis or the Pandits they fail to interpret the true version of religion. Religion, uh, in fact, has become a source of conflict in the society. In fact, the you while you are looking and you are going deeper into the religion, either you take the Buddhism or or Hinduism or Jainism or Islam. They are the religion is never a source of the conflict. The religion is source of peace, and but the religion has been uh, projected and promoted and used to generate the conflicts within the society. And this uh, for that, who are the responsible? The the the, the scholars, the scholars of religious scholars, and uh, they are responsible because. Uh, so you can very well uh, witness at the major level there is a decline of scholarship and further you know that who has become the uh, the source of uh, of preaching of particular uh, sex and society that there is also decline uh, of the scholarship in media that how the media or fake media or social media is is, is exaggerating these problems within the society or 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 uh, sentiments related to 
the caste, religion, uh, and other aspects. At the micro level, while you are investigating, what is happening that the conflicts, uh, there, there were conflicts earlier at the meso level or, or macro level, but it was not at the micro level. But these days at the micro level, while we are contacting with the other societies, for example, I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you about that South Asian version of Islam, that South Asian version of Islam is quite syncretic, quite progressive and uh, had been evolved uh, evolved uh, taking uh, taking the ethos and values of Sufism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and that we had been surviving together because it has the Turco Persian influence on the society and different. We call them the, these are Hanafi Hanafi Islams. But the conflicts has been created while the workers workers that uh, uh, skilled semi skilled unskilled workers had started going. Uh, started working in Gulf countries in the globalized world. And they have come into contact with the Arabian uh, type of Islam, Hanabali. And while they have seen that what they are preaching differently, the religion and the, what religion South Asian community are preaching today is different. So while they are coming back to from from uh, from uh, Gulf countries, their, uh, their home, they are, they started authenticating the religious ethos and values with Makkah, Medina, with Arabian type of Islam, and that has been created conflicts within the, within the Islam, within the, within the religion. You can see what is happening in, in Taliban, that there are progressive, uh, uh, progressive, educated, middle class people, but they are having contestations with Talibanis. They want to have Sharia rules. They want to have Quranic rules in, in Afghanistan. And that has created the conflicts between Hanabali and Hanafi. Uh, and this is also happening in, uh, uh, in, uh, in other, uh, other religious streams as well. So at the three layers, you can see that uh, uh, three layers, you can see that uh, the, 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 the religious ethos and, and the fundamentalism and extremism and radicalizations are taking place in these, these countries. And this has been linked uh, very well, like I, I'll give you one example, how it is, it, it is not just uh, confined to South Asian countries, it is having a spillover impact with, uh, with the other uh, extended neighbors, like uh, take the example of uh, Myanmar, where the Rohingya refugees that uh, that Buddhism, Buddhism has been known as the religion of peace, but that you know the, how the Buddhist, uh, uh, the majoritarian discourse had been uh, uh, persecuting or or suppressing and killing, and the genocides are going on in Arakan region of uh, of uh, uh, of Myanmar against the Rohingya, and you know more than one uh, million Rohingya refugees, the the Bengali Muslim communities had forced to migrate from. Uh, from uh, Arakan, from Myanmar to uh, to uh, to Bangladesh and other parts of the uh, of the world. What is most alarming uh, alarming situation is that that this radicalizations in all the South Asian countries are also linked with the uh, with the issue or the problems or threat of the drug trafficking. I'll not go with the, what what is happening in Afghanistan that how the uh, the, the opium uh, cultivations and how the drug trafficking tickets are taking place in Afghanistan. I'll give you the example of that, how the, uh, the Rohingyas are also used for the drug trafficking rackets. Uh, uh, they have been first prosecuted uh, uh, in, uh, and forced to leave the land, uh, Myanmar and to Bangladesh and other parts. Now they are also forcing these communities in drug trafficking because the, it is a question of survival, their survival. And recently, there are a number of reports that uh, the Arakan army, uh, Arakan army, they are uh, they are using these uh, vulnerable societies, Rohingyas, in 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 drug trafficking. Uh, the 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 Yaba pill is popularly known as Yaba uh, uh, pill. Was uh, they they are manufactured? They are they they are they are making in Kachi province of. Myanmar and they are trafficked by Arakan army using these Rohingya refugees. There are a number of reports like uh, in, in 2021, 5,20,000 uh, Yaba pills was caught uh, uh, by Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh BD, uh, BGP and uh, that cost around 1.8 uh, uh, million dollar, 1.8 million dollar as cost uh, of Yaga, uh, Yaba pills were there. So this increasing drug trafficking and nexus between the radicalizations will cause a further security threat to all the South Asian 
country so i think what i'm uh, my my in conclusion i would say that one side the south asian society is basically moving towards the exclusive notion of nation or you can say are moving towards the uh, towards the majoritarian discourse and the populist politics are have become in hand uh, hand to hand with the with this uh, uh, majoritarian discourse and this majoritarian discourse uh, are further exaggerating the problems of radicalizations and fundamentalism in south asian countries and these are used by the uh, by the uh, no, uh, violent non state actors in, in for for their for their motives in in the drug trafficking and human trafficking and all that and finally the most vulnerable sections in the society the minority communities are suffering in all these south asian countries thank you very much for giving this opportunity i i tried to take the uh, uh, the oral approach of south asian countries thank you thank okay. you sir uh, for enlightening us and you covered i think all uh, uh, spheres all challenges uh, to human security in south asia uh, we are learning a lot from your speech i think all the uh, presenters in the inaugural session it is a very good start for our conference because we are touching every sphere of uh, human security and governance and i think in 3 days we will have separate papers uh, we will have elaborations and uh, all the topics you have selected uh, to speak in the inaugural session i think people are presenting papers also that i think uh, paper presenters already pre uh, present in this session so they will learn a lot from your speech thank you again sir uh, now now uh, i want to uh, invite uh, professor uh, sujit uh, datta uh, to deliver a vote of thanks he is associate professor department of international relations university of chittagong bangladesh he did his phd uh, from school of political science and politic public administration at uh, shandong university china uh, before that he had worked at the brsc training Pro uh, division as a faculty member uh, he uh, has authored several articles and book chapters on different issues in the renowned national and international peer review journals and presented several research papers in international seminars and conferences in china india malaysia nepal sri lanka and bangladesh uh, in the covid 19 period uh, pandemic period he had attended several international webinars as a resource person in several countries uh, he is also uh, organizing uh, secretary uh, of this uh, conference. Uh, so, um, uh, over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Dr. Nondoni to give me a chance to extend the vote of thanks. And I, on behalf of this uh, conference committee and the entire community of all collaborative partners, first of all, extend my most sincere thanks to the Lord God. And I extend a very heartly vote of thanks to the chief guest and other special guests who spared their valuable time for his busy schedule and grace the of the occasions. I thanks to all the speakers for the gracing your crucial work and sharing with us uh, your opinion and finding this present time. Thanks to all the people who are directly and indirectly uh, helped to make this event successful so far. And I want to give a special thanks to Interdisciplinary Institute of Human Security and Governance, Delhi, India, in collaborations with the Center for Country Studies, Midberg Institute of International Studies, Monterey, USA, Security Women, United Kingdom, Department of Politics and International Relations, Central University of Jharkhand, India, Department of Defense and Strategic Studies, Himachal Pradesh University, Simla, India, and Department of International Relations, University of Chittagong, Bangladesh, is hosting this, the IISG uh, International Conference on the 23rd February to 25th February. And I want to special thanks to our guest of honor, uh, Professor, Professor Dr. Eleni, uh, Eleni, Eleni Karmark, Andrew Carley, Dr. Oruna Martin, Dr. Pushpur Layard, Dr. Aloka Parikh, Dr. Sanjoy Badraj, Dr. Raspal Budania, 
to give their special speech on the human security and governance. And I hope all of you will stay with us for the next three days and acquire knowledge from this conference will help to ensure the human security and the go good governance for the global perspective. And thank you all. Thank you, Nandini. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I want to add a few points uh, to your vote of thanks, if you permit. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, in last month, Amity Institute of Liberal Arts, Amity University, Uni University Mumbai became part of uh, the conference as collaborator. Uh, sorry that you, these are not mentioned in the brochure and the conference page because in the last month it happened. Uh, uh, second thing is that I want to uh, say special thanks to our uh, people who are working their night uh, in the back. Uh, first of all, uh, Vikas, uh, who is the creative designer, uh, Hemendra, who is also the creative designer. Uh, I want to thank my student, Ananya Bhattacharya, uh, uh, who is uh, helping me uh, for uh, making the media report. Uh, I want to thank Rita from JNU. Uh, to man I know I, that you will manage three days. Uh, otherwise, even I can't go to washroom if you are not managing. So thanks a lot. Uh, 